Um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction and kind of talk about how we got to this point. Um, as some of you guys know, if you attended Laura's engagement in September, we're doing a Women in Leadership Speakers this sh speaker series this year. Uh, it was brought to the university by John Bach. He had done something similar at SLU. And so we met last April and he said, I want you to put this together. And um, I said, okay, well, the first step is going to be to survey the students to see who they'd like to hear from. And I didn't even really need to survey to know that Dean Carpenter was going to be part of the lineup. I kind of assumed for, for two reasons. Um, one is uh, that she's, um, she's pretty visible, and I knew that the student body would be really, really interested in hearing from her, and certainly the survey results came back. And, Dean Carpenter had a lot of votes, um, but also I've worked with her uh, with the communications learning community, and so even though she's not technically my dean, she's she's such a committed person on this campus. She's so committed to the students. So I'm sure if you're in the SOC, you know that, and maybe if, even if you're not in the SOC, you know uh, her commitment to students and her commitment as an educator. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about her before. I give her the floor. Um, as Dean, she's the Chief Executive Officer of the School of uh, Communications. So she's responsible for all of the academic offerings, the faculty, the staff, and the students. And she's responsible for the financial management that provides all of the resources necessary for staffing, faculty hires, and equipment to provide to the students, uh, which, by the way, is about 1,400 undergraduate and graduate students at Webster Worldwide. She's been Dean of the SOC for 16 years and during which time she's added online degree offerings, a degree completion program, online programs for undergraduates, and both graduate and undergraduate media communications offerings at five of our international campuses. So there's plenty to celebrate about Dean Carpenter, but you didn't come to hear from me, so I will give her the floor now, so please welcome. That was very sweet. That was a very kind introduction. I have to tell you that because this is my last year as dean, that I really welcomed this opportunity to kind of put together my thoughts about what leadership has meant for me in this role for the last 16 years. Uh, so I really thank you all for um, inviting me here today. You've really done me a great honor by asking me to be here. and. Um, and in preparing for this conversation that we're going to have today, I really looked at my whole life of leadership, and it went back to when I was six years old was the first thing that I had in my mind about being a, a, a leader of some kind. I won't say it was a very um, uh, enlightened leader at six, <laughs> because I was really interested in having my brother and sister do things for me, and that was kind of the leadership role that I had <laughs> at the time. But I boil down um, all those experiences down to four main points that I want to, that I would like to share with you today. And you shouldn't worry too much because I don't think it'll take more than three or four hours for us to get through that. <laughs> so just so you know what the big big issues are going to be, what the four points are going to be. One is leadership is hard, and I know that everybody in this room already knows that. That's my first point. Second point number two is leadership is complex. Number three, leadership is fueled by different motivations for different people. And some of those are better and higher in consciousness than others. And the fourth point is that leadership is a worthy and spiritual life's pursuit. So I kind of start out with the hard part, but then I end with why it's worth it. Why would you spend your life doing this? So go back to that first point about leadership is hard. It's actually physically, emotionally, and spiritually hard in all cases um, if you're really invested and you're really doing it the way you want to do it. Physically, I don't know, has anybody in here seen an old 70s movie, What's Up Doc, that had Barbara Streisand in it? Has anybody seen that movie? It's really old, but my family thinks it's hilarious, and so we watch it every Thanksgiving and have for the last 20 years. But there's a scene in there where there's a night court judge, and he's got He's obviously very frazzled, and it's night court, so it's really the dredges of humanity. And he's standing at this table, and he's got, he just comes in, and the bailiff announces him, and he's kind of, you know, shocked by the loud noise, and then he puts this series of pills out on the table. And, and so the bailiff says, what are these pills for? And he says, well, this pill is for my heart, and this pill is for my cholesterol, and this pill is for my stress level. And then this green pill, this green pill is to remind me to take the blue pill. And this orange pill, they won't even tell me what that's about. 
And so I use that as an example of physically how draining it can be to be in, in a position of authority because it takes a lot of pressure. Um, my friends tell me that I used to say five and six years ago that if I had to take a pill to keep my job, then I was going to have to quit my job because that would mean it had gotten too stressful. So there's that. There's, a, uh, there's uh, some statistics about the physical strain of being a leader. Um, a survey of 10,000 uh, civil servants, so in government work, leaders in that position, a survey over 10 years, uh, said that people who were working more than the, than the normal work days on a consistent basis had a 67% higher rate of heart attack, chance of a heart attack, than those who worked a regular uh, normal period of time. And just so that you can relate that to my experience as dean, sometimes, and Susan is here, she can kind of verify this, um, that sometimes I have seven meetings in a day, and those might go from the morning all the way through the evening. And when we were working on assessments, Susan and I were spending 14-hour days for really about six to eight weeks trying to get the assessment package for the School of Communications all formalized and submitted. In fact, my husband would bring us food at 3 in the morning when we were working on that project. Um, so physically, I think it's pretty obvious that you have to be doing the things that um, Laura said last time, last month, about balancing your life so that you don't get burned out because it can be such a physical drain that you can really um, not have what it takes to survive in it. Emotionally, um, it's also hard to be a leader emotionally because if you are invested in the people that you're working with and that you're leading, there are going to be times when you have unhappy moments. Um, by working together every day for years toward a common goal of providing student opportunities, I made some very good friends with other administrators here at Webster University over those 16 years. As you all know, there have been a lot of changes and many of those people have left the university. That was me losing friends that I worked with every day. So that was emotionally hard. Um, when you lead people, sometimes they let you down. Sometimes I let them down. That's emotionally hard as well. Sometimes you see people struggling with their own integrity and their own value system. And because you are a leader, you see more about their lives than maybe other people see. And that's hard as well emotionally because there are things that you can't help people finish. Some things are left up to them, and it just leaves you in a position of watching them and hoping the best for them, but not always being able to ensure it. But the hardest part of the job emotionally um, is that in those 16 years of being dean, I've lost four students, and that never gets any easier, and that is something that is always going to be with me, is um, remembering each and every one of their passing. Um, it inspires me more to be with the current students, but there's an emotional aspect of being the leader of the school when something like that happens that I don't think can ever, you can ever really forget. Spiritually, um, sometimes I think being a leader makes you wonder about yourself. Am I doing enough? Am I doing the right work? Am I doing what my calling is? Um, am I living up to my dharma? Dharma is a word that's used in Indian uh, mythology about uh, your purpose in life, in a career. Are you doing what you're being called to do? And I think that's a lifetime, ongoing conversation and questioning that I have for myself. So again, this is the hardest part of the speech because I'm saying leadership is hard. That's number one. But you already know that. So that's not really new information. The second point is leadership is complex. An average uh, week in my role as dean has many, many, many variety of different things that are happening. In fact, I've got a little handout here that this is just a sample week. You can just take one if you want. You won't be tested for this. <laughs> it gives you an idea of some of the variety of experiences that happen when you're a dean. Um, and the different stakeholders that you're responsible for and the things that you're trying to get uh, to have happen. So you have a wide variety of tasks as you can see when you take a look at this. Um, cheerleading, you're rooting for everybody on your team to do the best job they possibly can. In my case that's faculty and staff were all cheering to get all the resources and all the um, activities lined up so that students have the very best experience they can have. 
So that's a cheerleading function. You're setting an example. I'm sharing a vision about where I think the school should go. I'm managing details. I'm serving as a spokesperson sometimes. I'm often juggling different interests. Something might be good for one department or one major and we have to weigh that against what's good for another one. We're problem solving together and individually and we're managing people, which in the case in academia, since we're all so independent in the faculty, that's like herding cats. Okay, the third point is that leadership is fueled by different motivations for different people. The how of being a leader was beautifully addressed by Laura Eschbacher at your meeting last month. Laura summarized how to be a leader down to four important points worth remembering. Have confidence in yourself, have empathy, be honest with yourself and with others, and be willing to help. And if you remember, she had this beautiful story about even finding a shoe for somebody that was missing a shoe. Um, so there is no task that's too small for a leader to try to accomplish to help their, her team. And I couldn't agree more with her assertions about how to be a good leader. My question is, what motivates us to do that? How do good managers and good leaders get such big jobs and stay with them? How do we answer that question about what motivates us individually? How do you keep going, each one of you, in your leadership roles? What about you is fulfilled by your daily effort to be a leader? One standard format of measuring motivation that many of you are familiar with is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we start as human beings being motivated by the most basic needs. Do we have our basic food and water and shelter? Are those needs met? Do we have safety? We're coming up a little bit higher on the hierarchy. Do we have love and esteem of others? So being appreciated by others is a little bit higher. Do we have self-esteem, which is even a little bit higher? But then the ultimate is do we have self-realization in our world around us? And those are motivating factors that we all dip in and out of different levels of. But we hope that we're all seeking something that's a higher level of consciousness, which is that self-realization. You can be a leader and have a very ego-centered way of leading, or you can be a leader that has a selfless, more self-actualized way of leading people. So I think it depends on you individually and what your personality is about. So some of the things that I know are motivating to leaders one thing is other people's approval. Have any of you ever taken a leadership position because other people have told you you're really good at it and you should do it? I'm seeing you nod. So how many of you have been in those shoes? Absolutely, I totally get it. So then there's the other phrase about, you know, you're a natural born leader. Has anybody ever told you that? You know, Laura, I know you mentioned it in your speech, so I know you have. Money is a motivator for some people to be a leader. Do leaders usually get paid more? Yes, in, in most business positions, leaders are paid more. Responsibility, if not me to do it, who will do it? Has anybody ever said that to themselves? You know, like I've just gotta pull it together and get that done for us. Vision, I've got a vision of something where this group could go further than it's going now, and somehow I think that I can make that happen for you. Anybody in that? in that role, see a few people. How about obligation? Anybody have a sense of uh, that you've been given a lot and so therefore you have an obligation to give back? That's another, that's another sense of being a leader. There's actually a phrase for that, noblesse oblige, which is that French phrase about how uh, people who have been given much should also be contributing much back. I'm really um, fond of remembering a story that Kathleen Kennedy told. She came here, she's the daughter of uh, Ted Kennedy, and she was a guest speaker at Webster maybe five or six years ago. And um, there was a little meeting in which she gave a presentation, and she said that her father, Ted Kennedy, whenever they went on family vacations, they went to someplace nice for a vacation, but they never left that city without driving through the poor parts of town because their family felt that they had so much and that they were committed to giving back to others who were less fortunate. So there's that kind of a sense of obligation as well. Power. There are people who take leadership positions because they want to set the agenda, they want to be in control, and that's also another motivator for some people. Having your dharma be associated with being a leader is something that is individualized, but someplace you might come to that point, or you may already be there, where you feel like it's just your job to be a leader. 
So you can see all of those things, there could be a high road and a low road to all of those things. So just if you took a look at it, others approval, is that a lower on the hierarchy of needs or is that a higher on the hierarchy of needs? Somebody give me an answer for that. Lower? Okay, it can be lower, but it, how could it also be higher on others' approval? Contributing to your own self-esteem. So it could be that that's what you need in order to do more service in the future. So it could have a positive impact. Money is one that you'd automatically say that's probably at the lower levels, or power and control, because those words have negative connotations to them. But could they be turned around to being, a, if there was an enlightened leader, that they could be a higher format of motivation for people? Money, maybe they give their money away. You know, maybe they earn it and they give it back to other causes. Um, power, how could that one be either on, on, either on the lower end or the higher end of self-actualization? Would you say Gandhi was a powerful person from what you've read? I would, and I don't think of that as a negative. I think of that as being somebody that used that power for something that was a very big vision to make changes that were needed in, in society. So I think any of these things don't necessarily have a negative or positive connotation. I think it depends on the stage of life you're in and the stage of spiritual consciousness and development that you're in. Because I think the same list can be high or low. And I don't think it's possible for anybody but the individual leader in self-assessing to know where they fall out on that scale. So motivations can vary by age and they can vary by social and personal spiritual development. Child leaders, how many of you in here, when you were just young, had some experience where you were a leader? Okay, a lot of you. Mine was, again, my first leadership role was when I was seven, and I created the horse club. And not only did I create the horse club, but I enlisted my younger brother and sister in being in the horse club as the only members. They really didn't have an interest in obtaining a horse, but I had a very big passion to obtain a horse. So then I elected myself as the president of the horse club. So I would say that was my first official leadership role. At which point we needed to have money raised so that that would be the point of the club, would be to, to gain the horse. So I lived in Kansas and we had a big family garden. And at the end of the season, we took all the potatoes and we put them in the basement for the next season. We kept those potatoes until spring. But there were always these little baby potatoes that were just in the hills on, in the garden and nobody would gather and harvest those. So I actually had my brother and sister, who remind me of this to this day, bag up those little potatoes and in a little wagon take them door to door selling those little potatoes to raise money for a horse that they didn't really want. So that was my first initial. I, I'm just claiming that I was very young and I wasn't involved very much about my status as a leader, but that was what I did. Then I took all my golden books and I decided to be the head librarian of a library. And so I put little jackets on the inside, scotch taped in with little library cards and I was only eight at this time. And again, my poor brother and sister were my only audience. So they had to take out the books instead of my sharing my books with them. They had to take them out of this lending library. And then, of course, there were fines if they didn't turn them back in on time. And the money, once more, went towards a horse fund. So I think in our early stages, probably we have a sense of leadership, but it's not very evolved. And maybe you have some situations where you could you could think about how involved your ego might have been at that point. So in high school, there was another big rash of leadership for me and for you, I'm sure, in which you were then participating in a variety of things because you weren't really sure where your leadership skills were going to take you. So for me, I was on the debate team, and I was in girl. I was went to Girl State, and I also. Um, did something again that wasn't very involved, which was that I found out that if you stayed in Girl Scouts through high school in the town that I grew up in, there were only three senior Girl Scouts in the whole town, which meant I had a pretty good chance of getting any kind of fully funded trip that was gonna come through for Girl Scouts because there were only three of us. So because of that, I got to go on the covered wagon caravan through Kansas on the, um, 
let's see, it was the Santa Fe Trail that goes through Kansas. And um, the ruts are still there in the ground, and we did ride on, on a covered wagon through the, through the plains of Kansas. And there were people on, cowboys on horseback coming with us. And rattlesnake truly does taste like chicken because we actually caught a rattlesnake and fried it over a campfire. So the nobleness of my endeavors even in high school are somewhat suspect. My motivations were not very advanced, and I think I was doing things for me, me, me. That's the ego mind. And I think then when you get to college, you're a little bit more advanced. Maybe you're finding that in your situations. Maybe you're finding a place to say no, a place to choose the things that you become involved with, a place where this vision becomes more important to you about how you share that. And I guess I'd just like to say that the insights that Laura gave last time are things that I wish I'd known when I was in my 20s. Um, because I think if all of you share those kind of um, really evolved sense of what being a leader is at this age, um, that you really are on an advanced path for getting into um, a, a type of leadership that really gives back and is very noble. Um, because it is a group of women, I thought I'd ask if there was, uh, just as an aside, do motivations vary by women and men in leadership positions? And I think traditionally you've seen things that have said that women might be more likely to be motivated by problem-solving satisfaction and their relationships with other people. And that men might be more motivated as leaders about growth or expansion or public agenda or winning. And I would suggest that I have not seen any difference. I have seen women and men play both sides of those sets of motivations. So to me, I don't think there is something that a woman leader has that a man leader doesn't necessarily also have. It's more about personalities and uh, your way of dealing with the world rather than it is about gender. That's just my opinion. So my question is, why would you become and stay a leader? And for those of you in this room, I would suggest that you cannot not be leaders because you've already chosen to be in situations where that part of your personality is being played out. Um, a mystic and a Jungian uh, psychiatrist, Jean Shinoba Bolin, has a quote that I like to use about this. And uh, it's in her book, Goddesses in Every Woman. I think of the self as a generic term for whatever we experience as sacred, divine, or spiritual. It has to do with personal values and integrity and what is deeply right for each of us in particular. There are significant choice points in everyone's life when what we choose and who we are become linked. At these moments of truth, we find ourselves at a fork in the road and have to choose which path to take. There is always a cost to these choices the price we pay is the path not taken, that which we give up. I assert that for those of you in this room, the die is already cast for you. You've already chosen or been chosen to be a leader, and that's a very good thing for the world, and I hope for you as well. Would you like to know why I think it's good for you? Let me end my remarks by sharing life's lessons to date about the rewards, my final point about being a leader. Leadership number four point. Leadership is a worthy and spiritual life's pursuit. As human beings, as on one globally interconnected world, we have to address this question. The world has to have strong leaders at this point in order to survive. It's not an overstatement. We have to have strong leaders or this planet can't survive. It's that important. Chaos and destruction are the consequences of not having good leaders. How can we raise the consciousness of leadership so that it matches this huge problem that is before them? The rewards for being a leader are very personal and very great. For me personally, my rewards are independence, working as part of a team in an organization, the variety of tasks that I get to choose to do, having a self-directed agenda, controlling my choices to some degree, and a sense of accomplishing big things, starting five international campuses, growing our student body from 200 to 13, 1400, but mainly by watching people. That's my biggest accomplishment and my biggest reward. I like to see people advancing and doing better. I like to see them learning and growing, and I like to see that the, the opportunities that we provide for them are things that they take advantage of. But the very, very biggest reward in being a leader, the thing you should take away from today, is that by being a leader, 
you have an opportunity to learn to know yourself. You really have an opportunity to learn who you are. Know thyself. Your friends will tell you only certain things about yourself, mostly about your strengths and your virtues. That's why they're our friends. Your enemies will only tell you bad things about yourself. We don't want to hear only bad things about ourselves. And while that's enlightening, that's not a balanced view either. Being a leader exposes you to yourself in ways that nothing else can. It's a furnace. It burns away your ego, if you let it, leaving a diamond of your values in its place. It's a journey from naivete, from being that six-year-old with a little club and an idea of an objective, to true personal knowledge in your life's journey. Every day for the past 16 years as dean, I've learned something about myself. Sometimes these are things I'm really proud of. Sometimes they are things I am humbled about in others. Sometimes there are things I wish I didn't know about myself, but now I do. But all of it is learning that I couldn't have learned in any other way for me, so forcefully or in such a clear manner than by being a leader. Combine what I've learned about myself from being a leader at Webster University to what I've learned about myself by being a leader as a mother, and you have a blueprint for my entire life. My whole reason to date for being born and living on this planet came through those ideas. So all of you leaders in this room, please take this little reminder. Susan has something for you. She's going to pass out for me. To stop every once in a while in your perpetual leadership obligations to look in the mirror and ask yourself, who am I? Because getting to know yourself is the biggest advantage of being a leader. Continually getting to know yourself is, for me, the greatest reward. So in summary today, yes, leaders' jobs are very hard. Leaders' jobs are very complex, and our motivations are completely different. But the well-being of our individual selves, as well as the well-being of our entire Earth, depending, depends on having leaders willing to do the job who are enlightened. We don't need more egotistical or self-centered leaders. We need leaders who are conscious of the higher service of the role that they perform on Earth. In the end, I've learned to pray for all our leaders. I hope you'll do this too. If praying isn't your thing, send them positive energy. At the very least, avoid piling negativity onto your leaders. You, more than the masses, know how hard the job of leadership is, and you know the potential good that can come of enlightened leaders. I'll add your names to my list of prayers in the future because I have confidence in each and every one of you. My final thought to share with you is that I have learned to pray in sincere thanksgiving for a wonderful life of leadership that has helped me to learn a lot about myself and those I've had the privilege to lead. To know thyself, the ancient Greek aphorism, is a worthy life. Some have said to know thyself is to know God. Thank you. I'm open for questions. <laughs>